of the word. We're only going to, we're covering uh, verses uh, 10 through 19 today, but I want to read it all in context, 1 through 19. We're in the book of Acts, continuing the great story of the early church. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. That is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I don't know if you ever heard of a man named Chuck Colson. He was a Republican political operative who once boasted that he would walk over my own grandmother to make sure that President Richard M. Nixon was reelected. He described himself as a hatchet man for Nixon, who was responsible for compiling an enemy's list of journalists, politicians, and activists who were perceived threats to the White House. Known for his political ruthlessness, he encouraged the dark impulses of Nixon's mind and acted on those impulses instead of ignoring them and letting them die. What landed him in prison was his peripheral involvement in the Watergate scandal. This caused him to give his life to the Lord Jesus Christ on August 12th, 1973, when he became a new creation. The man who brought him to faith was a nobody named Thomas L. Phillips. Ignoring his lawyer's advice, Colson pled guilty to obstruction of justice, saying that it was, quote, a price I had to pay to complete the shedding of my old life and to be free to live the new. He was sentenced to one to three years in prison. His newfound faith was met with skepticism and ridicule by many columnists, many thinking it was a jailhouse conversion to lighten his prison sentence. In his biography of Colson, Jonathan Aitken wrote, Colson has found religion was the New York Times headline. The news media across the country followed suit. Columnists, editorial writers, and cartoonists had a field day of mockery. One wrote, quote, I cannot accept the sudden coming to Christ of Charles Colson. If he isn't embarrassed by this sudden excess of piety, then surely the Lord must be. But it was indeed real. Despite the naysayers, according to his biographer, doubts about the sincerity of Mr. Colson's conversion were put to rest by his subsequent actions 
on behalf of prisoners around the world. Prison Fellowship Ministries was founded by Colson in the United States in 1976. It grew into a worldwide movement with branches in more than 110 different countries. Not only that, but he established the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, an excellent apologetics ministry of which I derive a great benefit from. When Saul of Tarsus became a believer after being blinded by the light from heaven and having a direct conversation with Jesus, he too was met with the same type of skepticism by other believers in Jesus. After all, how could such a ruthless man be changed so suddenly? This is what happened after his Damascus Road experience. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into the, to Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. What a shock. What a trying time this must have been for Saul. Can you imagine? The very person of Jesus Christ confronted him in his error of persecuting believers, knocked him to the ground, and then blinded him for good measure. Think that would get your attention? You bet. I'll never forget the weekend that God revealed himself to me. That weekend was a spiritual battle for my life and for my soul. I sensed beforehand that there might be a God, but who was he and what did he want? I didn't know that through the years of living on the edge of drug addiction and living the wildlife that my best friends had been praying for me. But what did God want? Where was he? Who is he? I stayed up for three days, knocking on strangers' doors, looking for answers. I was given a vision of heaven and hell. Finding a random set of keys, I actually walked into an apartment complex and started opening doors to see where are these keys, whose apartment they would unlock. I was a little nuts. The television actually spoke to me, freaking me out. What did all this mean? Finally collapsing on my living room floor, I prayed, God, I give up. And on December 2nd, 1990, I gave in, bowed down, and looked up. Now, it was yet another few weeks before I ended up in church and understood that Jesus was my Lord and Savior, but God used two nobodies, Mark and Deb McRae, to lead me to him. And here's good news for all of us today. God still uses nobodies. He used another nobody to bring Saul of Tarsus to faith. Acts 9, 10 through 12. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. There are two nobodies mentioned here whose names God has redeemed. Judas and Ananias. Previously, we knew one as the betrayer of Jesus and the other as the first struck dead because he lied to the Holy Spirit. But now God honors and uses these two unknown guys to advance his purposes. Listen to how attentive Ananias is to the Lord's voice. Get this. Yes, Lord, Probably haven't said that in a while, have you? Let's all say it together right now. Yes, Lord. God would have people help Paul at that little hot box that's crowded and you'd be sweating, miserable work. I'm not lying, right? <laughs> Can't win with the guy. Either way, he needs help. So what's a great answer we ought to say if God's speaking to you? Four people, Paul. Sorry. I tried my best. Okay, it's not up to me. Now, yes, Lord, is the same response a young boy named Samuel gave when God called him. 1 Samuel 3.10, the Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. 
Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Okay, how many kids we have here? Speak, for your servant is listening. Go. Hi. No, that isn't what... <laughs> speak, for your servant is listening. No, no. Okay, each of you, okay, here's what you say. Speak, for your servant is listening. Go. All right. Paul needs help at that little booth. Before telling him to sacrifice his son as a test, God called out, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? You know what Isaiah said? Here I am, send me. Let me ask, are our ears as attentive to the voice of the Lord when he speaks to us in his word? What has he told you lately? We ought to be like that old dog listening to the Victrola when it comes to hearing the voice of the Lord. Sadly, for many of us, God needs to shout at full volume before we listen. Sometimes, sometimes he's got to even rock our world before he gets our attention, right? Let me give you some advice. Save yourself some pain. Listen and obey him now. Save yourself some pain. Listen and obey him now. Now, seek the Lord while he may be found. Don't be so casual about your relationship to him. If there's one thing that I have been a broken record on in the 31 years that I have been a Christian, it's that seek the Lord. Read your Bible. Come to church Sunday. And don't just leave it at that. Come to a midweek study and get involved in the greater fellowship of believers because that's where we grow. Now we have a whole different one on Thursday, as Royal said, and it's completely blowing me away. People are like confessing their sins and talking about their struggles, and I go, oh my gosh, maybe it's just the, the environment. I don't know, but it's pretty awesome. Or you can come to the book club and talk about those things. We provide lots of opportunities. It's more than being just a casual Christian going through the motions. It's about living for him. It's a real relationship. Ananias listened. God called Ananias not for his ability, but for his availability. Are you available? Are you available? Now, God gives him very specific instructions on who the person is. Saul, where he will be, straight street, and what he will be doing, praying. Y'all know that God knows everything about everybody, especially nobody's, right? Let me remind you what Psalm 139 says. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. For some of us, that might be comforting. For others of us, it might be terrifying. He knows everything we do and everything we don't do. That should give us all, though, great comfort. Now, God uses a little bit of irony here. Saul got set straight, so God put him on straight street, which is still around, and it's known as Darb al-Mustaqim. That's from the early 1900s. Now, of course, Saul was praying. He's blind and most certainly dazed and confused. He was a Pharisee. He's used to praying long, showy, repetitious prayers, but this time, this time, all the rote, mechanical stuff was tossed away, and now he's praying from his heart. None of this rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, yea, God, let's eat. Or now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. No, not even Hail Mary full of grace. What do you think he prayed? Lord God, I didn't know who you were, but now I know who you were. 
I didn't know that these believers were yours. I didn't understand what I was doing. Oh God, help me. I don't care if you give me my sight back. Help me to live for you. I don't know what he was praying. Maybe he was just confessing, confessing, confessing his sin. But I'll tell you one thing, God certainly humbled him. Nothing like being truly humbled and having your whole world washed away to cause you to finally seek God. Again, let me say this. You don't have to wait till then for him to get your attention. You can serve him now. There's no guarantee you're not going to go through trials and tribulations, but don't do it, but don't go through it because he wants to get your attention. It's better you're seeking the Lord now, and then when the trials come, you go, oh yeah, I expected that. <laughs> yeah, I was just waiting, Lord. I woke, I, I got up yesterday, I got up from sitting, I got up and I tore my meniscus. All I did is stand up. Now I can't hide my limp. Even though while I'm preaching, I don't have any pain. Isn't that amazing? Maybe I just need to preach all the time. But it's funny, it's gone. I'll bet you it comes right. No, it's not going to come back. I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Ah, I wish it were that easy. But anyway, so don't ask me what's wrong. I think I tore my meniscus, all right? And I have a hip issue. It's like, man, I'm kind of like walking like this. John MacArthur said this. Prayer is the spontaneous response of the believing heart to God. Those truly transformed by Jesus Christ find themselves lost in the wonder and joy of communion with him. Prayer is as natural for the Christian as breathing. Saul, Paul, became a man of unceasing prayer. Are you a person of unceasing prayer? I'm not a man of unceasing prayer. I have to work at praying and remembering it. But I make time every single morning to spend time with the Lord. And I want to pray and pray for a blessing. There's people, Krista, 27 days, has to do with prayer, right? Bonnie, 10 days. Who knows the, 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 the earnest prayer? The earnest prayer, how's it go? The righteous prayer. The, oh my gosh, I can't remember it. Tell me, what is it? Come on, someone should know this. The earnest prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. There we go. I did remember. I was just testing all of you. <laughs> now a double vision is given. Saul was told what would come next. Ananias was the guy to tell Saul what was coming next. Does God give visions today? Yes or no? God speaks primarily from his word, but he can do whatever he wants. But listen to this. A vision will never contradict his word blaspheme Jesus or mock the Holy Spirit. One man told about a woman who told him about a vision in which Jesus appeared at the foot of her bed and told her to divorce her husband. So she did. This was obviously not a vision from God. Ananias was still a bit reluctant to minister to this former persecuted though and you can under, persecutor though and you understand why in verse 13. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Knowing Paul's, Saul's bad reputation as a Christian killer, it's understandable that Ananias was slow to go. Same with Chuck Colson. It's understandable people didn't really believe him. He didn't yet know that God had done an incredible work in Saul's heart. Sundar Singh was an angry young man. After his mother died when he was 14 years old, he became a fierce opponent of Christianity in his northern India community. But then Sundar saw Jesus in a vision and his life was never the same again. One time an agnostic scholar asked Singh, what have you found in Christianity that you did not find in your traditional religion? Singh replied, I found Jesus. Yes, I know, the professor said impatiently, but what particular teaching of doctrine did you find? Singh simply repeated his answer, I found Jesus. Singh later wrote, when people ask me what made you a Christian, I can only say, Christ himself made me a Christian. When he revealed himself to me, I saw his glory and was convinced that he was the living Christ. 
formerly angry man Sundar Singh wearing a saffron turban and saffron robe was known as the apostle with the bleeding feet because of how far he walked, spreading the hope and peace he found in the gospel to Indians in an Indian way. Stories are still told of the amazing miracles that God did through Sundar. God indeed changes hearts of nobodies to do incredible work for him. Jesus would have none of Ananias' excuses. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. In God saving Saul, he shows that the unlikeliest of people to be converted are converted. If you're converted, would you consider yourself to be unlikely converted? Yes, I'm raising both of my hands. I cannot believe that I'm a Christian after the life I lived as a non-Christian. I cannot believe it, and my friends couldn't believe it. And I still can't believe it, that he saved a wretch like me. But what a calling Saul would have to endure. Do you hear what the Lord says to him? I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. This is the great inconvenient truth of being a Christian. Saul, then the Apostle Paul, would write this, 2 Timothy 3, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That sounds like a promise, doesn't, doesn't it? When was the last time you were persecuted for your faith? If it hasn't been a while, are you living a godly life? Someone's got to say something. More than that, Philippians 1.29, for it has been granted unto you not only to believe on the Lord Jesus, but to suffer for him as well. Isn't that nice? It's been granted to you to suffer for him. J.C. Ryle, I added this at the last minute. I, wrote, I read this yesterday and it spoke so much. New Christian, listen to me. Listen to what he says, because this is the truth. This is going to get you going beyond your training wheels. In his book, Holiness, he says, we have the privilege of being one of Christ's ambassadors. In his name, we can offer eternal life to any man, woman, or child who is willing to have it. In his name, we offer pardon, peace, grace, and glory to any son or daughter of Adam who reads this message. But we dare not offer that person Worldly prosperity is part and parcel of the gospel. We dare not offer them long life and increased income and freedom from pain. We dare not promise the person who takes up the cross and follows Christ that in following him they shall never meet with a storm. We know well that many do not like these terms. They would prefer having Christ and good health, Christ and plenty of money, Christ and no deaths in their family, Christ and no wearing cares, Christ and a perpetual morning without clouds. But they do not like cross, Christ and the cross, Christ and tribulation, Christ and the conflict, Christ and the howling wind, Christ and the storm. If you desire to serve Christ and be saved, I entreat you to take the Lord on his own terms. Make up your mind to meet with your share of crosses and sorrows and then you will not be surprised. For lack of understanding this, many seem to run well for a season and then turn back in disgust and are cast away. My pastor, Zach Nazarian, in my other church taught constantly on the Christian life that were guaranteed suffering, persecution, disappointment, and pain. So in my time of trial, disappointment, persecution, and pain, I understood it was just part of the walk. Did I like it? No. But I didn't curse God, say curse God and die, because I knew this is part of the plan. And I'm following Jesus because he saved me by having his son suffer and die after betrayal, persecution, and pain. How much more should his followers that has kept me walking the straight and narrow no matter what happens. So if God takes my daughters, whom I love so much, I'm still going to follow him. If God should take everything I should have, I will follow him. 
If I lo lose my position as a pastor, I'm still going to follow him. Do I want any of that to happen? Of course not. But I'm saying I'm not in it for the prizes. I'm in it for the prize. Jesus Christ and him crucified bought for me eternal life. I'm only here for a few more years. So if my meniscus gets torn, I just go, hey, it's part of the Christian life. If you see me coming up here in a wheelchair with David and Rick pushing me along, Casey holding the microphone because I'm paralyzed, I remember Jesus is Lord. Ray Stedman answers why suffering is a part of Christian life. He said, because of course suffering is the activity of love. It is love that bears hurt. Love suffers. It takes the blame. It takes the hurt. It is willing to endure. Anyone called to be a Christian must learn to suffer, must learn to love. Love is hurt in the process of loving. That is why in this fallen world, love must always suffer. No, this isn't a seeker-friendly church. I got to tell you the truth so that you will live your Christian life victoriously no matter what comes. The last few verses in Acts. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. Don't you love that? Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. That nobody, Ananias, who we would never hear about again, except in Paul's testimony later on, was obedient to God's call. And because he was, the Gentiles heard the gospel. We heard the gospel. And a great portion of the New Testament was written. Aren't you glad that God uses nobodies like us to further his purpose? Yes? He could save big celebrities and singers to proclaim the gospel, but he uses little people, unknown people, simple people to get his work accomplished. Don't you ever think this, oh, if only God would save that guy, he'd do such a big work for the Lord. We've all done that. And he never saves those people. Now those people get all the fame and glory now and then go to hell. Are you a nobody? Are you a nobody? If you don't say it, that means you're somebody full of pride and God's going to strike you down. I'm kidding. Are you a nobody? I guess I have to satisfy myself with that. Yes, good. God can use you if you're a nobody. Listen to this. This is amazing, whether you know these names or not. God used a nobody named John Stoppitz. Who? He's the man who helped lead Martin Luther to Christ. You have a picture of that guy? Yeah, look at that guy. Who's that guy? That's Martin Luther. Who's Martin Luther? He led the Protestant Reformation of which all of us are a part. We are Protestants because of Martin Luther and God. God also used a nobody named John Eglin. Who? He was instrumental in the conversion of Charles Spurgeon. He's the guy who Preach that lame sermon that got Spurgeon saved. But listen to this chain of events of God's sovereignty. In 1855, God also used a nobody named Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher and shoe salesman, to lead another shoe clerk to Christ. His name was D.L. Moody, the greatest American evangelist of the 19th century. In England in 1879, Moody awakened evangelistic zeal in the heart of F.B. Meyer pastor of a small church and one of my favorite dead pastors. While preaching on an American college campus, a nobody named J. Wilbur Chapman came to Christ because of F.B. Meyer preaching, because he heard Moody's preaching, who got saved because of a shoe salesman. But there's more. Chapman, while working for the Young Men's Christian Association, that's the YMCA, by the way, it used to be a Christian organization, employed a former baseball player, a nobody named Billy Sunday, to do evangelistic work. Billy Sunday became a great evangelist in the early part of the 20th century and held a revival in Charlotte, North Carolina. A group of local men were so enthusiastic afterward that they planned another evangelistic campaign. 
they brought a nobody named Mordecai Ham to town to preach. During Ham's revival, a young nobody heard the gospel and gave his life to Christ, and that young nobody was Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists who ever lived. That whole chain of Christian ministry beginning in the mid-1800s all started with one nobody saying, yes, Lord, a shoe salesman sharing his faith. And God still uses nobodies. He used Ananias to reach one man whose influence ultimately reached billions for the Savior, himself, a nobody from Nazareth. He may use you to touch a life that affects the whole world for Christ. But guess what? It starts in your home and in your own hometown. It's about faithfulness, not fame. Years from now, when people hear your name, they may just honor you with this question. Who? <laughs> Who are you? We are all just nobodies trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for how you use us. Thank you, Lord, that you are so gracious that you have used us to bring forth your word. Thank you, Lord, that you use us to encourage others, pray for others, rebuke each other. Thank you, Lord, we, all of us, nobodies, are here for your glory. Thank you, you used eight nobodies to start this church, God, and look what's going on. A great work still goes on here. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. May we continue to be obedient to everything you tell us to do. We love you, Lord, and we praise you commit our lives to you again. And once again, I pray, Lord, you give each of us a vision of what you have for us in Johnson City. And I pray this in your name. Amen.